Well, we are going to be going through a few quizzes that world-class poker player James Romero has made for PokerCoaching.com. I have not taken these quizzes yet, so I have no clue what they're going to say. These are very high-stakes quizzes from the $25,000 buy-in tournament in Uruguay that he did very well at. I think he did very well at it. I don't know. He won all the tournaments before COVID. And, uh, you know, now COVID sidetracked everyone when it comes to high-stakes live poker, but that's okay. Um, so we're going to be going through some of those hands. Before we get started, make sure you check out Brain Fuel. Yeah, Brain Fuel is the nuts. It's actually the super nuts. It's essentially everything you need to last through the day. I used to drink a whole lot of coffee throughout the day, like six cups. <laughs> and now I have one cup of coffee as soon as I wake up, and then I have Brain Fuel. You can get 15% off if you go to brainfuel.com and use promo code POKERCOACHING. I know a lot of you have already tried it out, and you love it. Uh, one of my employees actually said that he used to go from drinking a ton of Coca-Cola per day to now one Brain Fuel per day. It is a little bit strong. Um, tastes like Powerade, but like really concentrated. I don't have a problem with it, but he said he just uh, like cuts it with water and then drinks it throughout the day, and he's good to go. So anyway, check it out, brainfuel.com. Um, also, we're having a discount on poker coaching right now. You can get two months of premium for the, I'm sorry, three months of premium for the price of two. Three for two. Think of the value. Check that out at pokercoaching.com slash spin. And we also just released a brand new spin and go course. It is big. It is in-depth. It teaches you everything you need to know to crush spin and goes, which are a very popular game and they're booming right now. So if you ever wanted to get into spin and goes, now we have a full, gigantic, in-depth course, the only of its kind on the market, and it is just included in Poker Coaching Premium, just included, you know, no upsell, no charge. I know all the other training sites out there want to charge you an extra pile of money for every time they make some new addition. That's not how we operate. We just add lots and lots and lots of value to make it obvious for you to sign up at PokerCoaching.com. All right, we're going to take a look at some of these James Romero quizzes. If the volume's too loud or soft, let me know. I haven't tested this at all. Let's take a look. Uh, for those who don't know, we have a lot of quizzes on poker coaching. I just searched um, Romero, came right up. These came right up. But as you see, we have, I guess, let me see if I can pull this over so you can see a little bit better. We have uh, 1,200 quizzes on the site currently. You can search by by anything, like let's say you wanted mine. I'm sure you just search little, it'll come right up, right? Or if, say you want uh, Lexi Gavin, type Lexi, comes right up, right? You can also search things like uh, search by type cash games. You can um, search by the type of hand, like right. Like let's say I click here. For some reason, it brings up all the queens first. Anyway, here we have all the aces. Lots and lots of aces. Ace king. Twelve pages of this. Anyway, that's all there at PokerCoaching.com. Make sure you check these out. Okay, we are gonna go through. A few James Romero quizzes, because like I said, I try to hire people that I want to learn from, and James may be one of the absolute best poker players in the world. So let's learn from him. Let's see what we have going on. Hey, guys. Today we're going over 10 hands from uh, Uruguay 25K Super High Roller that I won about three months ago. Uh, we're going to review about 10 hands. In this first one, we raised sevens from early position. Leo Fernandez flats out of the big blind. Flop is ace, 10, four, flush draw. Checks to us. Should we bet 33% pot, bet 85% pot, or check? What do you think? What do you think we should do in the chat? Go ahead. Type what you would do in this scenario. Would we check, bet small, or bet big? I don't know the right answer. <laughs> We're going to presume James, is, uh, James knows what's going on. Um, this is a spot where this is a hand that is certainly fine to check, but since we raised from an early position, we probably just want to bet with everything here. Seems like a fine spot to bet small. One thing I have noticed is that as the board gets even more and more coordinated with big cards, GTO Solver likes to bet on the bigger side. It's maybe an 85% spot. I don't know. I would go for small bet. The answer is bet 33% pot. This board is very good for in position range and not so good for out of position. Um, there's a lot of turn cards and river cards that will even be better for in positions range so we want to make sure that we're putting in a decent volume of betting on this flop you could even see bet um, close to 100 percent of your range for about a third of the pot 
Hey, that's what I said. Um, so we bet one third pot. Leo calls. The turn is the jack of clubs. My question is, should we check, bet 55% pot, or bet 100% pot here on the turn? Oh, boy. <laughs> is this one of our bluffs? Well, in this scenario, we have to ask two things. First things first. Will the guy ever fold an ace if we blast turn and blast river? Some people will, some people won't. An ace is actually in pretty bad shape if we bet the turn and bet the river because my turn betting range and river betting range is going to be a whole lot of like two pair and better, right? Um, I think... Hmm. So if we have flush draws, we want to bet flush draws. I think it's fine to bet flush draws here. We're pretty unlikely to get raised. In spots where you are kind of likely to get raised, you should be less inclined to bet your flush draws. But I don't think we're going to get raised here all that often because I have all the nut hands in our range, right? I say I, you know, me, James Romero. Um, the problem with letting you check check is we just like always lose, right? Or we lose the majority of the time. If our hand had more showdown value, like let's say queen 10, I would definitely check it because then queen 10 can win at the river. Someone's saying 55% pot. If we go 55% on the turn, that does not set up a river 55% pot bet. Geometric bet sizing implies you're going to make the same bet on the turn and the river. Um, and when we bet flop and turn and river, often we're trying to be very polarized and trying to play for all the money. Notice here, if we bet nine big blinds, pot, and the opponent calls, we'll have 27 left, right? And uh, that lets us bet, you know, solid three-fourths this pot on the river if we feel inclined. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to do here. Is this a bluffing hand? I think you can go either way. Like, whenever I'm playing live poker, this is where I make a lot of reads. Like, if I can look and tell the opponent's kind of bummed here on the turn, I'll just always bet. If I can look and tell the opponent loves their hand, I'm never betting, right? So definitely definitely take that into account. What's the right play here? I don't know. It's probably, probably, do we really triple it off here? That'd be pretty, pretty aggressive. It's probably the play. Do we go big or do we go medium? I'm going to say big. No, bad the answer, answer Jonathan. is bet 55% pot. We're going to have loads of value bets on this turn. Uh, I think Eve. I was thinking about that actually. That like when you have almost no bluffs, you really don't want to be betting all that big, just because you have no value hands. Or sorry, you have no bluffs, right? When you have no bluffs, and your bonus range is in bad shape, often you do want to go for a smaller size. But there certainly are some hands you want to be betting big here with. So I thought maybe this would fall into that category. Apparently not. Even one pair hands. Many one pair hands are going to want to value bet ace queen, ace king. We have two pairs starting with jack 10, ace 10, ace jack. We have sets, aces, tens, and jacks. And we have king, queen. Um, so we have a ton of value bets. This is one of the worst hands in our range. I would imagine that we're probably opening. 8-9 suited and queen-9 suited and pocket sixes and pocket fives. So those are really the only worst hands here. Um, we're going to want to have about a ratio of 60% value, 40% bluffs uh, on this turn. And I think we have so many value bets that um, sevens is barely going to make it into a betting range here. So that's what we do. We bet half pot. So um, Bella says, but if you bet sevens, you're betting everything. No, 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 no. That's not true. Here, I mean, James has laid out what we're betting, right? We're betting our good aces and better. So we're betting with ace, queen, and better, which makes a lot of sense. We're checking ace, nine, and worse, right? And we're going to check kings and queens and king, jack, and queen, uh, queen, jack, and king, ten. Right? We're checking all the marginal made hands here. So then you take all of your garbage from the bottom up and you bluff it, typically. Sometimes blockers matter, but assuming blockers don't matter, um, what we would do is we would bet with the best hands that are happy betting turn and probably river, and then we're taking the hands that probably can't win at the showdown and betting them. And like James just laid out here, we have queen nine and nine eight, but like maybe we have eight seven, right? Um, suited, obviously. And then what other worse hands do we have? Maybe king nine suited, right? Maybe we have that. But we really don't have all that many worse hands here. So the hands that become the bluffs are the low pairs. So the question is, how far up the low pairs are we bluffing? And like James said, seven is, sevens is probably like right at the, the top of the, of the bluffing range. So we're not betting everything. 
Um, we're not we're not betting pocket sevens as if it is a premium hand or anything here. We're not value betting here. This is a bluff to try to get the opponent off of a ten or perhaps a jack or even an ace with a river bet if we feel inclined. Um, I I kind of agree with the chat here that. Seems like everybody would have preferred a slightly bigger turn bet. I would have preferred a slightly bigger turn bet too. But I get what James is doing here. The fact that he's value betting kind of thin, kind of thin, with like ace queen, you know? Um, as you bet thinner and thinner, you need to use smaller bet sizes in general. Just because when you bet big, what happens is a lot of the hands that ace queen wants to get called by will start folding. And that, that results in you not getting value. So if you're going to be betting a lot of stuff like ace queen here, then it's you, you probably should be going for a smaller bet in general assuming you have one bet size now the question is do you want to have two bet sizes um playing 25k super high roller tournament i think maybe you do um where you're structuring your range such that you have some super nut hands in your small bet and some hands like ace queen in your small bet and then in your big bet size you have like pretty good hands like ace jack they're happy getting a lot of money in so that's probably what I would do in this situation. One second, I have a phone call. Hello? Oh, we cannot do that right now. Um, uh, no, uh, I'll talk to you. I'll call talk to you later about it. Okay, thank you. We've had no cold water in our apartment for the last uh, <laughs> last week, so they were going, they want to fix that right now in the middle of the show. That's how it goes. Okay, they're not doing that. All right. Um, so yeah, I think I would have bet a little bit bigger, but it looks like James is going to go for small bet on the turn and then probably non all in bet on the river, which you know I think makes sense. But at the same time, I do think there's a lot of value in putting your opponent's whole stack at risk here because, like James said, he has all the nut hands and the opponent probably doesn't. He calls river is. The deuce of clubs and Leo checks to us. My question is, should we check bet 50% pot or bet 85% pot? It's not muted. I hope I'm not muted. Can you all hear me today? If you can't hear me, let me know. Do you all like this show? If you like this show, click like, click subscribe, click the notification bells below. Do we bluff the river? Mm, probably. Can't beat anything. We beat some flush draws, but not many, right? A lot of the flush draws are going to have a jack or a 10. Pocket twos got there. It's an obvious value bet. Um, I don't know. I think we got a bet here. So the question is, on the river, are we value betting ace-queen again? If we're value betting ace-queen again, then we should probably go for the small size. Assuming we want to have one size. Again, this is a spot where you may be inclined to have two sizes. Um, you say 50% makes no sense. If you have ace-king or ace-queen, like those are fine hands to bet half pot here, right? You're trying to get called by a 10 or a jack or ace-4, or ace-3, not ace-4. Uh -huh. um, some people think you can't bet 85% pot. Why not? 17 big blinds is fine. It's perfectly viable to bet, bet big in this scenario and then um, fold with your bluffs. Some people think you can't bet big with bluffs and then fold. Or are you trying to get his second pairs to fold? Yeah. Or his ace with low kicker? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're trying to get to fold here with this particular hand. Now, again, the question is, do we care about being balanced? Against many players, it could be perfectly fine to bet small with your value hands and giant with your bluffs because they're going to fold the giant bets and call small bets. Now, we're playing a 25K tournament against... Who are we playing against? Leo Fernandez. Uh, I don't know who this is, but I'm, I presume he's good. Um, in that scenario, we mainly care about being balanced compared to compare, caring about how do I get this guy to fold because we're not playing against a fish. If we're playing against a fish who you know will play poorly against one particular bet, then um, you know your, your strategy is very different than if you're playing against a good world-class player. Against a good world-class player, you're just trying to make the GTO balanced dish bet. So are we betting ace-queen here? Um, I think the answer is probably... I don't know. See, maybe maybe I, I would go for 85% pot here. I think that's pretty nice. I, I get why you do want to have some bluffs in your 50% pot range, though. So is this a 50% pot bet? I don't know. Um, typically, what I do, <laughs> uh, I learned this from Olivia Bousquet a long time ago, is that whenever you're, you have two bet sizes in the spot, your big bet size usually contains your lowest showdown value hands, like queen nine, king nine, nine eight, eight seven. 
and your smaller bet size contains hands like sevens. Because every once in a while when you bet small, your opponent will make a loose hero call with like 5-4 for no reason. And then you win, right? Whereas if you bet small with 8-7 with and you get called, you always lose, right? Um, so maybe this is a half pot bet. I don't know. I'm going to click 85% pot, but I, I get why you may want to go small. The answer is either bet 50% pot or bet 85% pot. I'm, I'm okay with really any sized river bet here. Um, the reason being we just have so many value bets uh, and sevens actually does a nice job of not blocking any of his pair plus gut shot combos that called the turn his uh, king 10 queen 10 queen jack king jack type of hands um, so i think he is left with a ton of ace x combos and even some jack x combos and some pair plus gut shots so i think he should be folding a decent amount here and you know we have so many value bets so i i would like to see a bet on uh this river card yeah and i, I generally agree with that here like like the he's, answer is like he said we we get a lot of tens and jacks that fold on the river maybe even ace x um you can't see putting in 85 percent and not jamming why not you really want to jam 1.6x pot in a spot where you could be jamming into the nuts? Notice your opponent has all the king-queens in their range, by the way. I want to make this really, really clear. They're going to call preflop with king-queen. They're going to check call our small flop bet with king-queen. They're going to check call our turn bet with king-queen. And they're going to be sitting here with the nuts sometimes. So we don't want to just be making too many aggressive, reckless jams here. So we can't do that. And betting 50% becomes suspect to an over jam. We don't have anything. We're bluffing. We're not, we're not value betting sevens here. This is a bluff. I don't, like, we don't care if they jam when we have sevens because we're going to fold. Do you fold to a check raise on the river? Yeah, we don't have anything. We're bluffing. If we bet the river and they go all in, we have nothing, so we fold. Whenever you bet the river and they go all in and you have nothing, you fold. Hopefully you all can look at this hand and tell we opened early position, we bet the flop, we bet the turn, we bet the river. This is not a value bet, okay? We're not value betting the sevens. Sevens are no good. We clearly lose here. This is a very, very obvious bluffing hand the question is should you use it as a bluff and i think you should because like james said here we don't have all that many worse hands besides king nine suited queen nine suited nine eight suited eight seven suited like that's it right one second i have to talk to my wife hey amy yeah. call the front desk if you want they can come fix the water now i already did can oh. i have five dollars you have five dollars it's a pm i don't have anything small there you go you're welcome. All right, bye. All right, we're back. Sorry for all the distractions today. Let's go through another hand. All right, let's see what's happening. This is hand number two of the 25K Super High Roller. It folds to us on the button. We have ace deuce off, and we min raise. We get a call from Neil Farrell in the big blind. You should have uh, quite a wide calling range here from the big blind uh, maybe 65 percent of hands um, we see a king five five flop he checks and the first question is should we check bet 33 percent pot or bet 66 percent pot no i don't have five dollars just blasted away with pocket sevens yeah, funny enough, uh, <laughs> we were just debating whether we're, we're going to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in a few days. And um, the question was, do we buy tickets for like 75 bucks or do we get a year membership for 200 And <laughs> I'm like, just get the year membership for 200 She's like, you know, you're just spewing money, right? I'm like, yeah, but I mean, just spewed a bunch away online, so what's the matter? Um, this seems like a spot to go frequent and small. I think checking's fine too, though. I don't hate checking. This is a spot where I think if our hand's a little bit better, we can check. But I probably just bet small with this one. Do we check this board against the big blind? Not necessarily. I do know Neil likes to get after a little bit. Um, he's he's kind of loose and aggressive and splashy. So you have to be a little bit less inclined to bet against people like that. So, eh, you know, you can go either way here. I think I'd probably just bet small, though. I don't think this hand's quite good the enough. The answer is check. In general, the button is going to be c betting the flop at a very high frequency against the big blind, but this is a unique flop in that it's not very dynamic at all, and I think that ace high will be good at showdown. So, 
this is this is where you have to definitely consider your opponent's tendencies, I think. Because if Neil is going to view the check check as a lot of weakish marginal made hands, he's just going to bet turn and river and put us in a bad spot. We got to fold a lot, right? Um, the problem with betting, though, is that he's going to check raise a lot. So you're kind of in a bad spot no matter what you're looking at against aggressive people. And I, like I said, I think if I had like ace jack, I would definitely check it. But I think ace two is probably weak enough to bet. There, there's some cusp right around here, right? Like what about queen jack? Is queen jack a hand you want to check? Probably not, right? So there's some line right, right in this vicinity where betting becomes ideal. Somewhere between, I don't know, queen nine and ace four or something like that, if I had to guess. Let's see. What are we all saying in the chat? Some of you betting, some of you checking. Ian says, I love this. Well, if you love this, check out pokercoaching.com. We have over 1,200 quizzes. That's a lot of quizzes. We have over 1,200 quizzes. Also, lots and lots of classes. As you see, we have all of this content on the site. Click on quizzes, brings up all a load of quizzes, etc., etc. All right. James checks. Let's see how we play. Hopefully we face some aggression. Quite a bit, and I think it's semi-likely to get to showdown. Um, so I think this specific hand works really nicely as a check. It also strengthens our checking range so that when we check behind on the flop, we don't just have only air like queen 10, queen jack um, that have to fold to bets later in the hand. So I think this hand works really nicely as a check. Turn it. It's interesting that he's saying that like queen 10, queen jack have to fold to additional aggression, but ace two maybe does not. And again, there's always some line where like, yeah, queen jack folds by the river, ace two does not, right? Like, sure, I, I can get behind that. Um, it's always tough to know where that line is though. The best players in the world, like James, know where that line is better than uh, less than best players in the world like me. <laughs> is the 10 of spades and Neil decides to bet about 50% pot. Uh, my question is, should we fold, call, or raise? I mean, annoying spot, but I think you just have to call, right? Annoying spot, annoying spot. The answer is call. I don't think Neil's going to have any problem finding enough bluffs here on the turn uh, from his very, very wide preflop range. I also... What he means by this is um, any gut shot is going to be betting. Any like any flush draw is going to be betting. Any like hand that just completely like showdown value, you may even decide to bet like seven six. Right? This is a spot where I think it's a pretty easy call. Question is, what do we do on the river? And this is actually what I was saying, right? Like whenever you let it go check check in this spot, this is the situation you face very frequently, where Neil's going to bet the turn and the river. As long as you have a pretty clear plan of what to do in that scenario, it's fine. The downside to betting the flop is that sometimes you get check raised, which is just miserable, right? So if you think you're going to get check raised on the flop a lot, you should just let it go check check and find yourself in this spot a lot. And if you think your opponent's going to just fold a lot to a continuation bet, you might as well just throw out a continuation bet and sidestep the spot. I think he will have a decent amount of aggression on this turn because our range looks so weak after checking back the flop. Uh, I don't really like raising because I think a lot of our oh, nice. trips and good kings would have just bet the flop. Uh, and, you know, that's how the population plays. So I, I don't think that our raise would get too much credit here. Uh, additionally, I think the ace high is going to have enough equity versus his bluffing range uh, that it fits more into a uh, call here. So we call and the river is the three of clubs. Neil now bets half pot. My question is... Should we fold, call, or raise? I mean, this is a total brick on the river. Anytime you get a total brick on the river, you need to be finding a lot of calls. So this is a spot where it's very important to fully assess and analyze your range. Because you should probably defend at roughly minimum defense frequency here against most people. In PokerCoaching.com, by the way, we have homework. You see the homework right here? When you click on the homework tab, it brings up various questions. And I asked how you would play your entire range in scenarios like this, pre-flop on the flop, on the turn, and on the river, right? What is your strategy? What is your strategy with your whole range? And going through this exercise forces you to go through and see how far up in your range is this ace two offsuit. And, you know, going through the quizzes is fine and good, but you don't necessarily know 
where the ace two is in your range. Like obviously it's somewhere in the bluff catching vicinity, but it's definitely low on that spectrum. Now the question is, is it high enough on the spectrum to justify calling? And in this spot, we gotta be good 25% of the time. The minute defense frequency is pretty high. What's the opponent betting? A third pot. So we need to defend about two thirds of the time, something like that. Sorry, right. bet divided by bet plus pot. Brain's not working this morning. Bet divided by bet plus pot. Yeah, two thirds of the time. Um, it's close. It's close. You almost want to raise. So look, the problem with raising here is that Neil has all the fives in his range, right? And I have none. So it's very hard to find bluffs here in this scenario in general. Um, like, just because you don't want to be raising all that. Like, what are we actually raising here? R weird slow played fives, turn pocket tens, river pocket threes. So you get you get to bluff with a few sporadic bluffs every once in a while, but like not many. Um, this seems like an either, either a call or a fold to me, depending on the opponent's strategy. If I was playing against Neil and Neil thinks I am normal, I think it's just a call because I think he likes to bluff. I think a lot of the young kids like to bluff. I'm playing against James Romero, I'm probably going to find a call, right? I'm going to call against the young kids. If this was a weak, tight, straightforward player, though, I'd be more inclined to fold. Uh, so I'm going to answer call. The answer is call. Um, he bet half pot, so we are contributing 25% of the total pot if we're to call here. So we only have to be right one in four times to make the call. I think it's going to be quite easy for him to overbluff, um, spade draw missed, all the straight draws missed, uh, and it's a paired board, so I think the big blind um, could be overbluffing here. I think it's going to be quite easy to overbluff. Additionally, I think if he had a five, he would probably um, overbet, so I think we have a nice bluff catcher here um, with ace high. So I called, and he had six seven uh, air ball. which makes a lot of sense he's at the very bottom of his range and uh he unblocks uh spade combos so we call and we win the pot unblocks spade combos means that i am more well james here is more likely to have flush draws which will call the turn and fold to a river bet right if neil has spades in his hand it makes it more likely James does not have spades in his hand, which makes it more likely he has ace high or some pair that's going to call, right? So the fact that Neil has 7-6, which is like totally irrelevant hand, is makes it a good bluffing hand. Um, the fact that James has the ace of spades is actually bad for James um, to some extent because now, I guess actually it doesn't matter because we have ace high, right? Just like we lose all the better ace highs anyway. So now when we have ace of spades too, you know your opponent can't have ace of spades nine, of spades, right? So I guess it doesn't matter all that much. So sure, find the call. Um, let's see. Why does paired boards correlate with over bluffing? Um, it's not the paired boards that are cor that are going with over bluffing. It is the, the the two connected cards up here, plus the fact that it goes check check, and James is gonna have a lot of marginal made hands like Ace High in this spot. Um, so Neil's range is wide open, right? He called the preflop raise, and he was forced to stick in with the entire range going to the turn because it went check check on the flop. So Neil's range is like 65, 70 percent of hands, something like that. So very, very wide. On the turn, 70 percent of hands is just in bad shape against Ace High. Now, obviously Neil could be betting only for value. I don't think he is, but he could be. And if he is, then obviously Ace Two is not in good shape. But like I said, Neil's good, aggressive player. He's going to take hands like this and bluff them. I think I actually said 7-6. I mean, I have not played these quizzes. I want to make that perfectly clear. Um, but like in this scenario, if you give him queen nine or 7-6 or 9-8 or spade draw, like he's going to bluff him. He should bluff him. And what a lot of people do wrong in James's spot is they check, check, flop with ace high, pocket twos, pocket fours. They call a turn bet and then they fold to a river bet. And that is a gigantic blunder against good players and um you know james realizes that and he doesn't fold how does it play differently three-handed very differently ace high is way worse three-handed bluff catchers go way down in value as more people see the flop because someone's likely to have something there we were against a super wide big blind range on a rather uncoordinated board right 
All right, let's take a look at another hand. Are you enjoying this? If you're enjoying this, click the like and subscribe button, also the notification bell, and check out pokercoaching.com slash spin for a discount. We have over 1,200 quizzes at pokercoaching.com. We're adding more and more every day, so make sure you check it out. I actually just recorded about 20 quizzes last week, so lots and lots of content coming. A little bit deeper in the tournament now, we have four times the starting stack. In this hand, we have about uh, 50 big blinds. Under the gun raises, it's Ivan Luca, high stakes reg. We have King Jack suited on the button. Question is, should we fold, call, or through bet? Seems like a good spot to call to me. Um, should you fold that previous hand against a bad player? Peter, what is a bad player? This is a big problem that a lot of people make, is that they don't classify players accordingly. I have a class going up on PokerCoaching.com very soon. For premium members on taking notes how to like really soundly take notes so that you're not wasting your time and you get good actionable information so what is a bad player is a bad player a maniac or is a bad player a weak tight straightforward player both of them are bad both of them lose but they play very differently right so you have to figure out what your opponent's tendencies are in which i said like neil if anything his bad tendency is to over bluff which i don't necessarily think is bad i think it's actually good but that is the um, exploitable thing that a lot of overly aggressive, good online players do, you know, quote-unquote wrong, is they bluff a little bit too much. That is a good strategy against the population. So if I know they like to bluff too often, that in turn lets me call more often, right? If my opponent's weak, tight, and straightforward, and I know they're never bluffing or rarely bluffing, then I have an easy fold. But again, what does bad mean? How much does it cost of access to all the quizzes? All 1,200 of them. If you sign up to Poker Coaching Premium, you'll have access to all of the quizzes. Go to pokercoaching.com slash spend to get a discount right now because we just released a brand new course. We released a brand new course and we give a discount. Most other sites out there release a new course and try to sell it to you for thousands of dollars. We release a new course and give you a discount because, yeah, you know, why not? Uh, King Jack 2 is a good hand to call. Ivan Luke is a lunatic, by the way. Um, he, he'll get in there and battle. He'll battle really, really hard. Um, if you three bet, he's gonna four bet some. You don't really want to get four bet. <laughs> to be fair, if I even Luca four bets, you can't really fold. <laughs> We're getting a little bit deeper in the tournament now. Okay, so sorry. Yeah, there we go. We call. Easy call. The answer here is call. We are not going to have a very high three bet percentage versus early position opens because this range is so strong. Our value range is going to be something around queens plus and ace king since we don't have that many value hands. Um, we're also not going to be bluffing that much. Let me show you the uh, the charts. If you're a premium member of pokercoaching.com, we have these GTO charts. Click on tools, MTT preflop charts. You can also access these on your app, by the way. We have a poker coaching app. Let's make this a little bit smaller so you can see it. So we are playing what? Let's call it 60 big blinds deep. We are on the button versus a raise from under the gun. You see King Jack suited here, very, very clear call, right? Um, hands where your bluster come from. I like bluffing ace 10 offsuit a lot. I like bluffing King Jack offsuit a lot. I like bluffing these low suited ace x, king x suited a lot. I think these are all pretty good hands to go for the three about bluff with. Notice you do get to call a pretty good, decent amount on the button. I don't think you necessarily have to call all of this marginal stuff, but, you know, whatever. If you want to compare this to a 40 big blind chart, I know we're playing um, 50 big blinds deeper, so we're somewhere in the middle. But as you see, like, you see ace-10 offsuits just very often used as a bluff, right? And king-jack offsuit. So I, I usually use these hands a decent chunk, just because they have good blockers. So, you know, make sure you reference the charts. No, I made this small, too. Let's see. Okay. Uh, also, uh, the bluffs that we want to choose to use for three betting should be hands that don't play as well as a flat, hands like ace, deuce, three, ace, six suited, and king, queen, offsuit, something like this. Uh, so it folds around. Ivan bets one third pot. Question is, should we fold, call, or raise? Easy call here. What do you think about people who turn up with charts in real life? Do you agree? It's borderline hilarious. I mean, I reference the charts all the time. I don't like screwing up. I'm playing for real money. If I am playing in a scenario where I expect to find myself in a spot where I do not know the answer, I'm definitely going to look it up before the hand even starts. For example, say I'm on the button, and I raise, I know I'm going to raise a lot because everybody yet to act is kind of passive, and I know both the players in the blinds have 20 big blinds. 
I would be a fool to not look up what I'm supposed to do if I raise and they shove. Like what hands do I call with it? It's very important to know this, right? So reference it. Doing that makes you get a whole lot better instead of just sitting around and, um, you know, squandering your time. Um, top pair, bad kicker. Pretty easy call, I think. I'd say it's not best bad kicker. It's not really bad kicker. It's fine kicker. Um, again, I'm presuming we don't think Ivan's insane. Against an insane person, you may just want to put in a raise here and not fold. I mean, it's very aggressive, but we are getting to the middle stages of the tournaments. So, you know, you're not trying to go broke. <laughs> Easy answer here is Easy. call. <laughs> uh, folding is out of the question, and I think if we raise and then bet on future streets, we're only going to get called by worse hands. So I think I would raise this flop with king 10 plus at a pretty high frequency. But also the benefit to just calling this uh, flop bet is that it strengthens our um, calling range on for the turn and the river so we can't just uh, get barreled off uh, every time we call a flop bet. So we that, call that point he just gave right there is very important, something a lot of people don't consider. What a lot of people do very wrong here is they raise flop with all of their kings and better, which makes their calling range like, poc like a 10 and worse, right? And if you have a 10 and worse and your opponent bets the turn and the river, often you end up folding everything in your range. You cannot fold everything in your range against good players. That is a blunder, an absolute blunder, okay? Don't make absolute blunders. Anyway, I can already tell you, like this hand, we're just going to call now. If, if Ivan bets turn and bets river, we're just having an easy call. All. If he and checks, he gets a little bit interesting. Bets the three of diamonds for about 65% pot. Call. Should we fold, call, or raise? Did he misspeak? Does it mean we only get called by better hands? Uh, probably. Sorry if he misspoke. It's easy to misspeak whenever you're making making content. Um, let's see. What are we saying? Oh, Glenn, hello. Glad you're here. This is a very easy call. Folding is out of the question, and raising doesn't make a lot of sense. So we call. Uh, River is an ace. Mm. And check, Ivan check, now check. bets again for... About 65% of the pot. Question is here is should we fold, call, or raise? Oh, look, Ivan Luca, I call. <laughs> so this is a spot where if I was against more straightforward player, I would fold. Right? We get an annoying river against someone whose range should contain some ace queen, ace jack type hands, or just like ace X, right? Ace five, ace three randomly. Um, against someone who only has good hands in this scenario, I think it's a pretty easy fold. Now, like I said, I know Ivan Luka's insane. And Ivan Luka could easily have random gut shots. He could easily have under pairs. Kind of like that previous hand, if you think about it. Remember how Romero had sevens and tripled it off? Ivan Luka could have sevens here and be tripling it off. Um, seems like a pretty easy call here. Ivan Luka, insane in a good way, you mean, right? LOL. Oh, no, insane's a good thing. Um, the way you win in tournaments is by being overly aggressive and accumulating chips that don't belong to you. Sometimes you're going to bust, but whenever you get a hold of all the chips, you win the tournament. Um, so anyway, this is I think this is a call against Ivan Luka, but against a lot of people, I think it's a, a an easy fold. Oh! On this Broadway board... It's a terrible river. It's a terrible river. I want to make that very clear. Facing a triple barrel i think it's going to be hard for ivan to find enough bluffs um you know some of his air combos here including hands like queen nine suited or jack nine suited um might have checked on any of the three streets so he doesn't have all eight of those combos to be triple barreling um we don't know if he's going to be betting, you know, sixes through nines at a high frequency on the flop, turn, and river. Um, so he doesn't have a ton of bluffs. Additionally, Queen Jack got there. He has a decent amount of other value hands, such as Ace 10, Ace King, King 10, Pocket 10s, Pocket Kings, Pocket Aces. Um, so I think he will be slightly under bluffing here. I think it's going to be hard for him to be over bluffing. Um, 
It's hard to be overbluffing, but if there's ever a player who will find the overbluffs, it's Ivan Luka, I promise you. As for raising, we would be repping exclusively Queen Jack with Could a raise. raise. And for the same reasons that I don't really like calling here, I, I don't really like raising into such a, a strong range. It, it, it is nice that we block a lot of his value hands holding the king. Maybe like Jack 10 is a better bluff. Typically in spots like this, whenever you like, you know you have a fold, you just want to raise with hands that block the nuts. So what hand, what hands block nuts here? Pocket queens and jacks, which maybe we don't even have. Maybe we'll probably have jacks, maybe not queens. But you don't, like queens is kind of in the same category as king jack. Um, so I think you kind of either want to block a king, a queen, a jack, or a 10. Because you call the races, right? Um, I think jack 10 is probably fine. King Jack could be fine. Like, I mean, yeah, I agree you don't have very many raises here, but if we are raising Queen Jack, which obviously we are, we, we do get to have some bluffs. I think King Jack's just a call, though, against Ivan Luka. Um, you know, and then also we're blocking some Queen Jack. Um, but generally speaking, I'm not really looking to raise Broadway boards versus a triple barrel from an under-the-gun range um with two light of holdings so i would uh, probably not raise here and i think that folding is the correct play nitty nitty romero jonathan Lull just pays off here maybe that's why i'm not top 10 poker player in the world like james romero is um why is jack 10 a better bluff than king jack they're comparable i think they're very similar right but i'm saying if i would have called with king jack then i think it's not a bluff hand, right? If you're calling with it because it's good enough to call, then therefore you have to look for weaker hands to bluff. And I think like Jack-10 is probably a better hand to bluff in the spot. Um, because I would have called with King-Jack. If we're going to fold the King-Jack, though, then, you know, maybe maybe it's okay to find the call in this scenario. I'm sorry. If we're folding the King-Jack here, it's easy to misspeak, right? If I'm going to fold King-Jack anyway, it seems like a pretty good hand to bluff with. Like, I mean, in terms of blockers, right? Because we block Ace-King, Pocket-Kings... Uh, and Queen Jack, so I don't know. That's a fun one. But like James said, you're really not trying to run too many bluffs here against Under the Gun because they have all the nuts in their range. But, like, I do have all the Queen Jacks, right? So given I have the Queen Jacks, I do get to bluff here some portion of the time. Going back to the preflop strategy, notice we don't have Queen Jack offsuit, but we do have Queen Jack suited. 40 big blinds deep, 60 big blinds deep, same story, no Queen Jack offsuit. So we have only four combinations of nuts here. So we really don't get to raise all that often at all. Um, even if I had, like, trips here, say I had, well, trips, even if I had a set of 10s or a set of 3s somehow, or a set of 2s, um, I don't think we get to raise River in this spot because, yeah, he could have Ace-King, but he also have Queens, Queen-Jack, and he could have Aces and Kings, right? Cool spot. I just pay off like a slot machine on the River. All right, one more hand for today. Getting deeper now. We have 7 million chips. Uh, we're getting kind of close to the money bubble. Folds around to Ryan R. Kemp, who completes in the small blind. First question is, what do we do? Should we check raise to 2.4x or raise to 4x? So I would just check this hand. Let's take a look at our handy dandy charts. 40 big blinds deep, big blind versus limp from small blind. Jack four suited, mostly checks. 40 big blinds deep, as you see here. Um, let's see what happens if we're a little bit shallow. We're 30 big blinds deep. 30 big blinds deep, jack four suited, mostly checks. That said, maybe this is a spot where Romero gets out of line. Getting um, so deeper. I would have checked here. The answer is check. When we raise here, we want to have a polarized range. We're going to have some of our best hands and some of our worst hands. Best hands and worst hands. Something you can do to kind of um, visualize this on these charts is if you look at this chart here, you see this chart here? This actually shows you where all the raises are coming from. So you're raising all the best hands, right? Clearly. And then you're raising a bunch of nonsense garbage, right? So relatively few suited hands, a lot of nonsense garbage. Um, same thing, 40 big blinds deep. See, a lot of the raises come from the total garbage and a lot of the raises come from the nut hands, right? 
not a whole lot of raises come from these hands that flop well. So that's going to be hands in this vicinity, right? Like all the suited marginal hands. And then also hands like 10-9, Jack-8, Queen-9, Jack-9. These hands are not raising all that often either. Okay? So this is a spot where the suited hands typically do a lot of checking. And uh, Jack-4 suited fits in the middle category. Uh, we would like to see a flop here and not to get 3-bet off of our hand. So we check. Flop is king-9-4. Reiner checks to us. Question is, what should we do? Check, bet 33% pot, or bet 75% pot. So Reiner's another one of these players who's good, strong, battly. He gets in there, he fights hard when he thinks it makes sense. But I think he's like a little bit more GTO-ish than some of the other players. Um, whenever you're looking at a lot of the good players, some players are just like kind of strictly GTO which does include a lot of bluffs. I think that's kind of Rainer, whereas other players are more like, you show weakness, I'm blasting you. Um, so two different kinds of players. This is a spot where I think you probably just want to bet one big blind. I bet one big blind here a lot. When they check, just bet one. Now, if your opponent's going to raise you a lot, then obviously you don't want to bet one. Betting here and getting raised is really, really bad. Um, so if you think you're going to get raised a lot, you definitely don't want to be betting. Rainer, good, strong poker player, is the type of player who will check raise or go for a check raise a lot in this spot because he knows from out of position you need to do a lot of checking typically. So I do expect Rainer to be check raising a decent amount. That's it. I'd probably just bet one big blind. The answer is check. I yeah. don't. So this is a spot where I think I'm probably just a little bit too aggressive in general. Blind versus blind. Um... Like I said, if I was playing against like a good GTO bot, I would just check. But I think against the population, betting one big blind is better. The problem is Rainer's not the population, right? The problem is Rainer is good, strong, world class player. So uh, I, I get the idea for this for this play. I don't think that he's going to be calling with a lot of worse hands. And additionally, we want to strengthen our checking range so that if he barrels on turn and river, we have more hands to call down with. If you bet a third pot, you can still get away from this hand. I don't want to get away from this hand. I have a pair. What do you mean? We have a very good hand here. Um, so, yeah, I think this hand plays very nicely as a check. I would probably bet most of my 9x, maybe half of my 9x, all of my king x, uh, and a mixture of draws and bluffs here on the flop. So we check. The turn is a 2. Reiner bets about half pot. Call. question here is... Easy answer here is call. Uh, Reiner limped pre-flop and checked the flop, so he's going to be getting to this turn with a very wide range, and it's going to be kind of weak. I think that he's going to have an easy time finding enough bluffs here for half pot. Also, uh, I think he could even be value betting worse hands, so we have an easy call here on the turn. River is the ace of diamonds, and he continues again for about 60% pot. question is, should we fold, call, or raise? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Annoying spot. Uh, this is a spot where Rainer probably doesn't have a whole lot of ace I mean, he should have some. Let's go over here, look at GTO strategy for small blind real quick. Um, let's see. I want to show you small blind, 40 big blinds deep, raise first in. Okay. Notice here, pre-flop, pre-flop. Assuming Rainer's going to play roughly like this, He's raising the majority of his ace x preflop, right? Not all, but some. A pretty good chunk of it. Kind of look up here and see a whole lot of red in the ace x line, right? Which means he doesn't have a ton of those. Also, he may just like bet a lot, bet those on the flop sometimes. Now, I do agree, Rainer's the type of player who will check a lot of ace x on the flop. But would he bet it on the turn? Like, probably not. So, for him to bet this river, he should be pretty polarized, I think. So, if he is pretty polarized here, then I think this hand's a pretty easy call. If he's more linear, though, like if he's just going to be checking some kings and nines on the flop and then betting turn and betting river, then obviously calling gets way worse, right? So in this scenario, it's very important to try to figure out if your opponent is um, either over bluffing, in which case it's an easy call, if they are polarized but weighted towards bluffs a little bit, it's also an easy call, if they are polarized and weighted towards value, it's going to be a fold, and if they are more linear and just betting like any nine or better for value plus a few bluffs and it's an easy fold too because we lose to all that 
that's usually how I'm thinking about this spot. Against Rainer, I just call. <laughs> I mean, am I just a calling station against all the good players? You give me a good player and they're betting on a scary river. I'm like, yeah, obviously they're going to bluff this river. Because, I mean, if you think about Rainer's range here, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what he's doing, right? Because would he bet a king like this? Rainer probably is the type of player who would bet a king here. But I bet if you give, give Rainer a bunch of nonsense garbage in this spot, he's also going to bluff it. I would really like to see a call in this spot, and that's what I did. Um, while the ace seems like a pretty bad card for our range, um, I think that Reiner will be raising a lot of aces preflop, and I also don't think that he's going to be betting a lot of ace on the turn. Hey, that's exactly what I said. Uh, given that his hand has some showdown value, I would expect turn bets to be more polarized before uh, between stronger value and bluffs. So I, I don't think he's going to have a lot of ace I do think he's going to have a significant amount of king X that are going to take this size. Yeah. So that's uh, really what I'm worried about. Um, that being said, all of the draws bricked and um, also were BVB. So I think it's going to be you know quite easy for him to find some over bluffs here on the river. We only have to be right one in four times. Um, so I made the call and he had 10-7, yes. which I think is, you know, played fine and standard by him. He is towards the bottom of his range. Um, and, you know, my range looks very weak. So I you know, it would expect him to put a lot of pressure on us. Um, Reiner's a good high stakes player and, uh, you know, we're approaching the money bubble. So maybe he thinks that I'll make, um, s some more folds than I normally would <laughs> oh no 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 james Herrero does not make folds everyone that's that's not how he operates all right well we went through four of these hands from this twenty five thousand dollar super high roller tournament today that james ended up winning about a year ago at this point uh, if you enjoyed this video do me a favor click the like and subscribe button if you liked this if you like this show if you like these quizzes head over to pokercoaching.com click on the quizzes tab it is right here quizzes will load up why is it not showing all my quizzes oh here we go i have to sort my number uh we have over 1200 quizzes we upload new quizzes all the time by all sorts of world-class poker players myself included i have a lot of these we have um some small stakes tournaments 22 dollar buy-in tournaments we have uh two five no limit hold'em 500 dollar turbo tournaments 50 dollar tournaments 510 no limit hold'em $25,000 buy-in tournaments, $1,000 buy-in tournaments by me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you check these out. We do our, we do our best to upload all sorts of uh, a wide variety of content. You can always search stuff in the, in the search box too if you like a particular coach, if you like particular spots. Like, um, let's see what happens if I, if I search. Um, well, so look, you can just sort by cash games, right? Sort by cash games, sort by blinds. You can do all sorts of stuff and you can find exactly what you're looking for. Also, poker coaching. We have a lot of classes. Loads and loads and loads and loads of classes. Literally hundreds of them. We have 15 pages. What's 15 times 25? Can anybody do that math? That's a lot. Um, recent class we just uploaded for poker coaching premium members. $25,000 super high roller win review by James Romero, I mean, by uh, Bert Stevens, currently the number two online tournament player in the world. And Michael Acevedo, he wrote the book, Modern Poker Theory. Also, we have content by Matt Affleck reviewing his $630 deep run recently. Also, Tommy Angelo recently. Me recently reviewing my $500 tournament win for 25 k that I won a month or two ago. So all that stuff's consistently going up there. Also, we have courses. We just uploaded a brand new course on Spin and Goes. Where is it? Here it is. Mastering Spin and Goes with Ryan O'Donnell. Very, very solid, big course. I'll show it to you real quick. You can check this out more thoroughly at pokercoaching.com slash spin. We have uh, preflop, all of these sections on preflop. We have flop play, going through all these spots, turn play, river play, specifically heads up. This is essentially a crash course on heads up poker because you do have to play heads up and spin and goes. And then videos have been playing all of the various stakes all the way up to $500 buy-in game. So make sure you check that out too at pokercoaching.com slash spin. That's me for today. Hope you all have a great, great week. Good luck in your games. I wish you all the best. Again, if you like this, click the like and subscribe button. If you want a deal on poker coaching, check it out at pokercoaching.com slash spin. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.